Hi, welcome to Entitled to Life, a podcast about healthcare activism, policy, and politics. I'm your host, Paul Gibbs, and here's my co-host, Katie Drake. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm very excited about today's show um, because we we have a really great lineup of guests. Um, We're having kind of a roundtable discussion about Medicaid and the HEROES Act, the most recent piece of legislation that was passed by the U.S. House of Representatives almost a month ago to deal with the COVID-19 crisis. It has not yet been voted on in the Senate. So we're talking about that legislation and the role of Medicaid in it. Our guests today, um, first up, we have a return guest, Stacy Stanford, healthcare policy analyst from Utah Health Policy Project. Stacy, it's always great to have you here. Thanks for having me back. And also we have Elliot Fishman, who um, from Families USA, and I already, I asked you your title just before we got started, <laughs> and I'm spacing it out again. Paul, I'm, I'm the policy director at Families USA. Thanks so much for joining us. It's really great to have you here. And we also have Joan Alker, who is the executive director of the Center for Children and Families at Georgetown University. So we have a great group of health policy analysts here to talk about this subject. Thank you all so much for joining us. That's all right, um, start with, let's, um, who wants to jump in and tell us a little bit about the HEROES Act and what it does? Elliot, yeah, do you wanna start and then I can fill in? Sure. Uh, so the HEROES Act, directs a lot of federal funds to propping up the economy at this time of shutdown in in various ways. Really um, continuing with the partial but very important success of the CARES Act, previous emergency COVID legislation in terms of directing a lot of support to uh, people who have lost jobs or losing employing income, employment income, directing some support to states. Um, there's a, a additional important elements in the HEROES Act. There's a specific worker safety element that uh, has been missing from, from previous COVID-related emergency legislation. Um, there's housing assistance. There's a really important piece in terms of being able to safely eventually open up the economy in terms of substantial funding for testing and contact tracing and quarantine activities. Um, states are really, um, at this point, struggling to implement that element on their own. There's a lot of variation between states and in particular local jurisdictions and their ability to do that. Another important thing that the HEROES Act does is to help people who are losing employer coverage to pay their COBRA payments to retain that coverage. Very few people are able to afford, especially in an unemployed situation, able to afford COBRA. It's pretty expensive. How how much more, sorry, I'll get to pop in there, but just for context for folks, Mm -hmm. um, how much more expensive is COBRA in general than their regular employee, employer health plan? It seems like it's a lot. Yes, it depends. The difference is the amount that the employer pays. So uh, really people uh, don't realize often how expensive their employer coverage is to their employer. And really ultimately that comes out of everybody's paychecks in one way or another. It's one of the reasons that the high cost of healthcare in America um, is very bad for our country in in a lot of ways. Uh, But what happens when you become unemployed and are offered COBRA is that uh, full cost is now uh, right on your doorstep. And uh, I think for many employers, you're, you're talking uh, multiples of what you were paying uh, out of pocket out of your paycheck before. Uh, many employers subsidize uh, a majority and, and even you know, a great majority of that premium. So it is a, a big sticker shock situation at the worst possible time. Yeah. 
certainly is, and you know, we're talking about when we're talking about covering people during the pandemic. I uh, the figure I heard was that the average cost for a hospitalization for for un, for uncompensated care for someone who does not have coverage for a hospitalization for COVID nineteen is somewhere in the area of seventy three thousand dollars. So we're talking about a very expensive proposition uh -huh. for people if they don't have coverage and a very expensive proposition to retain that coverage if they're not employed. So obviously yeah. this sounds like a very important piece of legislation that. Uh -huh. yeah. One thing I, there are a couple other points I'm sure Elliot was gonna get to, but just to say um, the legislation also increases the uh, share of the Medicaid costs, which as you know, are shared by the federal and state governments. And um, the Families First Act, which was signed into law in March, increased that share by 6.2% um, that the federal government will pay, which is very important because um, state budgets, I think Utah's is in relatively good shape, but I'm excited to hear from Stacy about that. But um, in general, state budgets are facing enormous challenges with serious revenue losses, and in some cases, Medicaid enrollment going up, we're, we're keeping a close eye on that. And so this has happened in past recessions that the federal government pays more, and um, the HEROES Act would increase that uh, federal share of the Medicaid costs, which is really important. Um, and also um, would increase the federal share of the cost of the Children's Health Insurance Program um, which is important as well. Obviously, Medicaid is the big, um, the big player here, and certainly for children as well. Medicaid um, is covering a lot more children, but both those programs, Medicaid and CHIP, we'd see an increase in the federal share, and that's very important. Absolutely. Um, yeah. One thing I wanted to just ask you guys a, a little bit here. Sorry to hop in here, Paul. No, um, no. You had a couple questions too, but I feel like this is, um, we're seeing um, a, almost a, a worst case scenario here for so many families, right? Where it's a huge medical event that is going to mean huge medical bills, but also a lot of people have been furloughed or lost jobs. So they've either lost coverage or are having to pay a staggering amount for their health coverage. Um, but then even if you do have your job, uh, you know, this virus is taking people weeks and weeks to recuperate to full strength. So you're going to blow through your sick leave very quickly, even if you um, have paid sick leave at your job. Is this, am I reading that right? Is this kind of, I know these stories happen on an individual scale all across America all the time, but is this kind of a, a catastrophic event where, where we're seeing this happen in a really large scale event? Well, I'll, I'll just quickly say, and then, you know, I don't want to hog up all the time here and look forward to hearing what Ellie and Stacy have to say. But, you know, when we think about the pandemic, um, st of course, started as a public health crisis, uh, but quickly turned into an economic crisis as well. And so, you know, I think families are really getting, getting hit from all sides here. Um, and you know, the other, the other issue, and, and the HEROES Act does address this um, to some degree, but um, the previous uh, legislation just uh, allowed states to do free testing for COVID, but HEROES actually adds on the treatment costs that states can That's provide, which of course is incredibly important because yes. uh, testing without treatment is kind of a bummer. Um, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, of course, people have other health care needs as well. Um, and, uh, and hopefully, um, you know, the majority of folks won't get COVID, but their other health care needs remain pressing. And, of course, they're um, potentially exposed to large medical bills if they've lost their employer-sponsored coverage. Yeah. You know, and one thing I think is really important um, for to be shared um, is that uh, – there are public coverage options available, and COBRA, as we talked about, is very expensive. Um, but certainly Medicaid is um, open for enrollment all year round. Thankfully, you have your expansion finally yes. in Utah. Um, and I just want to mention that because, you know, we're closely tracking Medicaid enrollment, and I'm curious to know what's happening in Utah. But it's 
some states we're seeing um, uh, some some growth there, um, but the March legislation passed prevented states from disenrolling anybody from Medicaid involuntarily. So that's one piece of really important information for the public. You can't lose your Medicaid. And also, um, particularly for families with a child, there is very likely a public coverage option for you. And I'm a little concerned that there's a lack of awareness about this. Um, particularly because, you know, the federal government hasn't opened up the marketplace. We hear a lot about deadlines, you know, you've got to um, sign up for your COBRA in this amount of time, or you have to, um, you have a special enrollment period for this amount of time, but Medicaid and CHIP are open year round. And so I think it's really important for folks to understand that um, there may be public coverage options available. That's good to hear. Yeah, I absolutely. Forgot and at Utah Health Policy Project, we have, um, you know, direct enrollment assistance that we're providing remotely, you know, that we can meet with people and share a screen and, and really walk through that Medicaid application or see if um, somebody qualifies for a special enrollment period in the Affordable Care Act marketplace. But we really are trying to help get people signed up and help them from a distance and, and keep that safe boundary. So we have that information on our website, healthpolicyproject.org. And um, speaking of enrollment, I can give just a quick update on that, but we definitely have um, seen an uptick. We, we saw uh, an increase of 15, more than 15,000 in April and about 7,000 in May, if I can read my little screen here. <laughs> um, and so the numbers are, are going up and we saw that coincides with unemployment you know we saw more of a spike in april than we did in may and so what you're saying about you know losing your job and having that be tied so much to medicaid we're seeing that in utah's numbers so stacy i'm this is elliot and i am gonna uh step through the fourth wall here and ask a question <laughs> sure so Go i'm for just it. curious as to katie's question what what you're seeing in terms of enrollment assistance in terms of the just the the very uh, potentially disrupted situation that people are trying to deal with losing coverage and employment and going through you know all sorts of changes to how they live their life um, in in the middle of a crazy time yeah I mean our um, our team that does that one-on-one -on -one enrollment work they're really seeing a lot of confusion a lot of stress a lot of you know real real worries about healthcare cost healthcare access i mean really everything we've talked about basically just in the last 15 minutes came up in our last staff meeting where there was one story shared about somebody that was having trouble accessing the cancer treatment that they needed and paying for it and somebody else that thought that they were eligible for medicaid but then got a notice saying they'd been disenrolled and it turned out it was a paperwork error but um you know and so we're seeing people really taking advantage of Medicaid and ACA, but still seeing a lot of those healthcare headaches that we've experienced for years amplified in this pandemic, for sure. Can I just say, um, thank God Utah finally expanded Medicaid. You can yeah, say that. Yeah. <laughs> you can say that. I pretty much say that all day, every day. Yes. So. Um, yes. And, oh my and God. You know, I just, I, I have to just make an editorial comment here. For a second, Stacy, those numbers you just gave, 15,000 people in April and 7,000 in May, that's something like 22,000 people. Math is not my strongest suit, but here I'm thinking about the fact that just last night here in Utah for the final debate in the, the primary for the Republican candidates for governor of Utah, we had at least one, at least one candidate who was a, the previous speaker of the Utah House of Representatives who fought very hard against Medicaid expansion and was still harping on it there in the debate. And I just, that floors me when we're talking about 22,000 people there who have insurance through this pandemic. And that's just the people who added in April and May. Yeah, it's really disappointing to hear that anti-expansion rhetoric continue, even as the state is experiencing such significant 
benefits because of it. So very disheartening. Absolutely. I, I, I also just want to point out that his mailers keep saying among his accomplishments was that he stopped Obamacare expansion. And I just want to point out again, Mr. Hughes, you didn't stop it. You delayed it. We won on this. We have, we have Medicaid expansion. So, uh -huh. um, <laughs> Stacy, you, um, you, we've talked a little bit in the past about how UHPP is promoting this and we're particularly looking at getting people all throughout the country, obviously, people can contact their senators about this, but we're particularly focusing on Senator Romney here in Utah, who has shown a bit of an independent streak over the past couple of months. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic and I'm hopeful in a way I might not have been in the past, but he is going to really listen to us on this. You, you've told me about some of the priorities of things that you want to emphasize at UHPP in the, the that Medicaid can do for let's talk about some of those things that are particularly important I, some of this has been brought up by you or Elliot or Joan in previous parts of the conversation but what are the what are UHPP's priorities with the with Medicaid and the HEROES Act and yeah so also just want to make a note that we've heard from multiple sources that the HEROES Act itself is probably a kind of a non-starter in the Senate. I just want to say that up front that we're probably looking at kind of a brand new thing in Absolutely. the Senate. And so kind of what we're advocating for with Senator Romney is like, okay, whatever package comes next, even if you ignore HEROES forever, like whatever you decide to do next, we have like just three top line priorities that we're really focusing on right now, and they're all tied to Medicaid. So increasing the federal match rate, like Joan mentioned, that helps bring in you know, federal money to help the state pay for Medicaid. And we wanna make sure that that is tied to the economic downturn and not the public health emergency, because the economic ramifications of this crisis are gonna linger even past, you know, potentially a vaccine or, you know, whatever comes with the public health crisis. And so we want to increase it and then make it longer lasting, the federal funding. We also want to provide that funding to non-expansion states and to the like Medicaid expansion population to entice states to, to expand Medicaid that maybe haven't yet. And so the, the funding that was in the Families First Act was in the traditional Medicaid population, but not for expansion. So we'd really love to see a bump for both. And then um, I really hope that one of the national experts can explain this next, next piece better than I can. <laughs> but we're, we'd, we'd like to see a repeal of the Medicaid fiscal accountability rule, which is a really wonky rule that takes funding from states at a time they need it the most, ties the state's hands when it comes to flexibility with how they can fund the Medicaid program. I cannot remember the number that we est the, the state estimated they would lose, um, but, but it wasn't insignificant. It was a significant number that the, the state stands to lose if that rule um, goes into effect. So those are our top priorities. All right, who wants to jump in and explain that, that rule? The, is, is that <laughs> the oh. MFAR rule? Don't get too excited, guys. <laughs> so, I, it, it's true that nothing says exciting podcasts like talking about the Medicaid fiscal accountability rule. But I, I, I think I, what I'll try to do is, is talk about what's, uh, what's important for state budgets and in particular what, what is uh, outrageous about the approach that was taken here. So, um, States have a variety of ways of coming up with their share of uh, the uh, financing for the Medicaid program. The Medicaid program is split between the federal government and states. Federal government pays most of it, varying percentage depending on the state. Um, and uh, states can uh, come up with their share using general fund tax revenue, using special sources of taxation. A lot of them 
uh, specifically uh, ass assess money from the healthcare industry, different parts of the healthcare industry. And there, there is a lot of decades of settled practice and settled regulation that states have come to rely on in terms of how they can finance their share. And uh, what this rule does is drops a bomb in the middle of all of that. And, and I'll say as somebody who, before working at Families USA, worked in the Medicaid part of the federal government, so was responsible for um, helping states figure out what they could do and what they couldn't do, all of these arrangements were set up with federal cooperation and generally, you know, with uh, extensive conversations with federal officials. So there's, there's really is a, a factor of, of states relying on some stability. And it, it's hard not to look at this. And, and um, I think Joan has uh, written very persuasively on this. And, and spoken very persuasively on this, it's hard not to look at this as being um, in bad faith. That, it, you know, it, it is the, the uh, stated rationale has to do with uh, kind of good government, fiscal accountability. But um, we have seen already multiple times with this administration, including in the most recent budget and in uh, their announcements around uh, Medicaid block grants uh, just a few months ago that uh, they are looking to shift risk and shift costs onto states um, for the Medicaid program. And there's this kind of antiseptic rationale behind you know, yet another effort to get at the same goal. Definitely frustrating. I, um, we're getting we're getting pretty close to wrapping up here. Um, first of all, I want to give just a moment for anybody who wants to just kind of make a final statement about what what is so important about this. What if there if you had to boil it down to one thing that you would tell people about why this legislation is so important? If you had to put it in just a couple of sentences, what would you say? Well, I, this is Joan. I'll just kick off to say I think it's important to keep in mind that Medicaid is really a first responder in this pandemic, and it's a first responder to both of the crises that we're seeing, both the health crisis and the economic crisis. So we really now more than ever need to keep Medicaid strong, and um, the federal government um, has a, an extraordinarily important role um, by stepping up in a recession um, to finance the program when states um, have challenges with respect to their budgets. That's the first thing. The second issue is we were just talking about is um, that the HEROES Act does put a hold on this pending MFAR regulation that Elliot was just talking about, which would be extremely damaging to the financing of the program. And um, and so I can't imagine a worse time um, <laughs> to pursue um, uh, an attack on the financing structure of the Medicaid program. So I think, you know, for all of your listeners and, and um, Utah obviously um, has just made a, a huge leap forward this year in expanding Medicaid, providing coverage to thousands of people. Um, that now more than ever, it's absolutely critically important um, for families in Utah to keep Medicaid strong. Thank you. That's, that puts it very eloquently. Elliot or Stacy, do you have yeah. anything you want to add? Or did she kind of say it all there? Or as much as, as close well, as you Joan can did. sing it all? <laughs> Joan did, uh, from my perspective, kind of say it all and it's not the first time that I've heard her do that but you know the, the one thing that I would add is just and thinking back to the um, financial crisis in 2008 is we really are are unfortunately at the beginning of a long road and uh, a lot of uh, even the partial elements 
in previous rounds of COVID legislation are, are, are now getting close to expiring or at risk of expiring. Um, and th this, we're gonna need significant federal support, both, both around healthcare costs and more broadly around the economy and around state budgets uh, for a long time to come. Uh, so the idea that we can just sort of get by with three, four months of legislation and then see what happens, I think is, is uh, very wrongheaded. Thank you. Great. Yeah. I mean, that really sums, I mean, people are still hurting and still need help. And state budgets are still hurting and still need help. I mean, increasing Medicaid funding could really help you fund to rely on social services. It sounds like we've mostly dodged a bullet in the cuts that the legislature will be voting on tomorrow, but that doesn't guarantee there aren't gonna be cuts to come if budget shortfalls continue. So they said that today in the meeting where they said, we're gonna spare social services. They said, but, <laughs> you know, th that's this time. So, so we really, the state budget could really benefit from this. And by helping the state budget, you help the people who benefit from the programs that the state is funding. So we, we have ways for you to email Senator Romney, ways for you to, to call Senator Romney. We have a scripts, talking points on our website. So again, healthpolicyproject.org, please check that out um, and contact the Senator and let him know that we need to take action in a lot of ways, but especially to protect Medicaid. Well, Stacey, I was going to have you finish this up with a call to action because you're better <laughs> at that than anyone I've ever worked with. Um, and you just showed why you're so good at it. You didn't even need the cue. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Everyone, anyone listening to this, if you're in Utah, use those resources to contact Senator Romney's office. I will be calling tomorrow, which when you're listening to this, that'll mean I called last week. But um, if you're listening from somewhere <laughs> other than Utah, Contact your senator, whether it's, whether your senator is a Democrat or a Republican, every member of the Senate yeah. needs to hear from their constituents that we need this legislation. Elliot, Joan, Stacy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Katie, thank you for being here. Yeah. All right. All right. You know, I never would have thought I would have become the kind of person who geeks out at the thought of Elliot Fishman and Joan Alker are going to be on my podcast, but... This is really exciting to me, having such great. Um, Ooh, I got okay. excited about fiscal rules, which are words I never thought I'd be interested in. So, <laughs> and it's anything I do with Stacy is always an honor. So, it's so great to have you here. Thank you all so much for joining us. And that's it for today. We hope everyone will join us again next week. Bye.